welcome all of you again for joining um, for this webinar today. It's, it's really nice to see all of you here. Um, uh, I'm Lucas, I'm the Policy and Engagement Lead for the Wellbeing Economy Alliance in Scotland, and it's me and my colleague Karis who are going to um, yeah, deliver this web webinar for you today. And um, yeah, just maybe to say in terms of housekeeping, we are recording this session, um, but your video shouldn't be on it. Um, and that will be made available afterwards. We will only be recording our presentation, which is hopefully going to be about the next 40 minutes or so. And then we have time afterwards for questions and discussions, but we're not going to be recording that. So um, that's that's just for us. Um, so I think we can um, probably make a start then. Um, so I'll hand over just to Karis. Great. Thanks, Lucas. Um, it's great to see so many of you here with us today. Apologies, I can't really see you very well while I'm presenting. So um, if you do have a question or you do want to say something, do raise your hand because that will put a notification for me that somebody is wanting to speak. Um, great. So today we're going to cover um, a variety of things. We're going to look at wellbeing economy theory um, and where it comes from. Uh, how it relates to other frameworks like donut economics um, and community wealth building. And um, we've got some case studies to share with you as well, uh, looking at what Scotland can do. We'll have plenty of space for questions at the end, so feel free to add them to the chat as we go if you'd like to, um, or you can um, unmute at the end as well and ask your questions. Uh, we won't record the Q&A portion of the event, so you can ask whatever you like without worrying um, about that as well. Um, so first up, we're going to look at where the idea came from. Um, and Lucas, if you could do the next slide, that would be great. Thank you. Um, so back in 2017, people were waking up to the fact that our economy doesn't deliver for people or planet, causing runaway climate change and growing inequality. So a group of people from around the world came together to look at how we can um, work together, which led to the emergence of the Global Wellbeing Economy Alliance, um, a collaboration of acad academics, sorry, NGOs, activists, uh, with the shared purpose of redesigning our economy so that it works for people and planet. Um, recently, the IPCC warned that we face a brief and rapidly closing window to prevent runaway climate change and secure a livable future. And that's only one of the environmental emergencies that we're currently facing. This diagram that you can see at the moment illustrates the planetary boundaries or thresholds that scientists have determined that we shouldn't cross. And crossing just one of the thresholds can lead to irreversible changes, and we're currently crossing several of them. We also can't say that the economy is working for the vast majority of people either. Because at the same time as this, we're facing unacceptable levels of poverty. Even before the cost of living crisis and even before COVID, one in four children in Scotland were growing up in poverty, and yet we are a rich country with no shortage of wealth. The 20 richest families in Scotland have more the wealth than the poorest 30% of people combined. So to imagine 1.6 million people, that's about 30% of Scotland's population, and that's the combined total of the population of Glasgow, Edinburgh and the whole of the Highlands and Islands. Um, and climate change and inequality are inextricably linked. What this slide shows here is that the richest 10% of the global population are responsible for about half of all CO2 emissions. However, impacts are disproportionately felt in the global south. In a previous role, I worked for an international development charity called Tear Fund, where we met and worked with people who are being impacted by the devastating consequences of climate change with increased flooding and drought, leading to families having to walk for hours every day just to get water. And we know that as well as being the biggest contributors, the richest are also best able to cope with the impacts of climate change as they can afford to protect themselves from extreme weather conditions. So how our economy currently deals with these challenges is, is, first of all, we get the economy to grow bigger, but we don't fret too much about the damage to people or environment that this does. Then we set aside money through taxes and we channel some of this money to help people and the planet cope with step number one. 
So that we grow, we measure that as well through GDP, which means we consume more and do more as well. But there are a number of problems with GDP. And for a start, once GDP reaches a certain level, it doesn't take account of diminishing marginal returns. So sorry if you're already familiar with this concept, but it's essentially the idea that the more you have of something, the less you feel the benefit of it. So we like to think of it a bit like salt. You need a bit of salt in your diet and it brings out the flavor in food. But the more you add, the less it's going to enhance the flavor or your health, which is a bit like economic growth. Countries or communities need enough of it to meet their basic needs, and it can yield returns when it's well directed. But you get to a point where the benefits of growth start to tail off. So this figure here shows how life expectancy changes as countries get richer, as measured by GDP. On the left hand side, you can see that life expectancy in very poor countries increases rapidly with GDP, but then it levels off. And after a certain threshold, people in countries with higher GDP don't live longer. So the US, the one of the richest countries in the world, has the same life expectancy as Chile, which only has a fraction of the GDP. And recently in Scotland, we've seen life expectancy stalling. And for those on the lowest income, it's going backwards. The same pattern holds for other social indicators too. So it shows that from a certain point onwards, increasing GDP no longer leads to increase in quality of life. Instead, it becomes much more important how the GDP is distributed and invested. For example, whether there are good systems of healthcare and education. So GDP often values what we don't as well. So cleaning up an oil spill might be good for GDP, but then unpaid care isn't counted. And care work is foundational to what we all need in order to live a good life. Growth in GDP has been one of the main drivers of climate change and environmental destruction as it's so linked to producing and consuming more. GDP growth is often used as an excuse not to tackle, tackle inequality. So by organising our economy around it and making policy decisions based on GDP, we end up setting the wrong priorities. Even looking at GDP in its own terms, it hasn't been very efficient at tackling global poverty as the majority of new wealth created goes to those who are already wealthy. And the World Inequality Report in 2022 has more details on that if you want to read it. Any links that we refer to as we go as well, we will share them with you afterwards. Um, we wrote a report uh, called The Failure Demand. Um, and what this talks about is how we have to patch up uh, the damage through the, that we're creating through the tax system. So in practice, we care deeply about things like poverty, health and climate change. So we set aside a vast amount of money made through tax to fix problems that are created by our economic model. For example, we rightly spend huge sums how, um, housing people who are homeless when we could focus on ensuring decent, affordable housing is available. And we provide social security to people living in in-work poverty rather than ensuring that work pays a livable wage. We task schools with closing the poverty-related attainment gap rather than working towards the eradication of poverty. We need to adopt a more upstream approach. So how do we design an economy that eradicates poverty and prevents homelessness? Our current economic model is an expensive and inefficient way of doing things. Recently, the Equality Trust published a report called The Cost of Inequality 2023, which highlighted that the UK spends more than anywhere else in Europe subsidising the cost of structural inequality. If we want to address the crisis, we need to redesign our economy so that it is aligned with the values and things we want to achieve. That's what we mean when we talk about a well-being economy. So in a nutshell, a well-being economy is an economy designed to deliver good lives for all on a healthy planet. The Global Wellbeing Economy Alliance was founded in 2018 to unite otherwise fragmented, under-resourced and fragile components of the new economic eco ecosystem, linking all layers within the system from individuals to institutions and local to global. We're pooling resources and brain power from thousands of change makers around the world to work towards a common vision as we put knowledge into practice and make a wellbeing economy approach the norm. And you can see that today we have 17 hubs now around the world, including ours here in Scotland. We have six national members of wellbeing economy governments, or WEGO, 
including Scotland, Iceland, Finland, Wales, Canada and New Zealand. These are governments that want to implement a well-being economy, sharing resources and learning. The Scotland Hub was created at the same time as the Global Hub, uh, not least because some of the founding members were based here at the time. And in the last few years, we've been able to recruit our first staff team, and there's now five of us. In 2022, we worked with our members to create a vision and action statement of what a wellbeing economy in Scotland could look like, which was supported by more than 115 organisations and academics. And in July last year, we republished our vision in a letter to the new government, which was supported by more than 200 organisations. So I'm going to hand over to Lucas now to talk about what a wellbeing economy looks like in more detail. Yeah, thank you very much for that, Carrie. So that has given you a bit of an idea of where the wellbeing economy idea comes from, why we need it. Um, but that now leads us to the important question of what actually is a wellbeing economy. And as Caris has already said, the concept is not very old. It's maybe been around since about 2018. But a lot of the ideas that feed into it have been around for a very long time. And it's not about reinventing the wheel, but really linking up a lot of the good ideas that are already out there. Um, having said that, there are some kind of core principles that we've been working on that we really put at the heart of how we think about a well-being economy. And that basically has two parts. So it's first part is about what our economy should be delivering. And the second part is, is about how we go about doing that. And so the first, uh, on the first question of what our economy should be delivering, we've been working with um, our members around the world and we've kind of come up with these kind of five headline and um, what we call well-being needs that our economy should be focusing on. And the first one of those is dignity, so the, that everyone has enough to live in um, safety and happiness. The second one is nature, so re restored um, natural and safe natural world for all life. The third one is fairness, so the idea that income, wealth and power is distributed fairly. And um, the fourth one is purpose, so that our institutions serve the common good and that you know, contributions to social and ecological well-being are rewarded. And the last one is participation. So it's really the idea that throughout our life, and that's in our, our workplaces, as in our countries and our communities, um, people have a, a meaningful say in the decisions that, that affect them. And as I said, these kind of were co-produced with um, our members, but they very much resonate with the kind of things that have been uh, identified in the well-being economy literature, but also like concepts in religious text and indigenous teaching, and are generally not particularly controversial when we present these, and hopefully it's something that that resonates with a lot of you as well. Um, but that the next question is then, how do we design an economy that serves these kind of needs? Because it's probably worth remembering why most of us probably agree on the importance of all of these five points. Our economy is not designed to deliver them at the moment. And that, um, and again, that is kind of quite a big transformation we are looking at, and we haven't got all the answers to that. Um, I don't think any one organization has all the answers to that, but we've got these kind of four principles, um, which we use and find very helpful as a starting point to think about the kind of changes we need to look at if we want to implement the well-being economy. Um, and you kind of essentially think about them as the corners of the jigsaw puzzle that we're trying to put together. And they also all start with a P, which um, is good because it makes it easier to, for me to remember them. And so that's purpose, prevention, pre-distribution, and people power. And so I will take you through them um, now and tell you a little bit about more what it means and also some examples of, of how that um, how you can think about these. So the first one is purpose and that's really the idea that we embed that purpose of serving um, people and planet at the heart of our economy and make it a driver of decision making across all um, levels and all areas of economic decision making. And so in practice, at a national level, that, for example, means replacing GDP with a more meaningful measure of progress. 
and not just replacing GDP, but also making sure that the new measure actually drives decision making in a meaningful way. For example, um, an interesting example where New Zealand has started experimenting is that they have a well-being budget where they've been more explicit about aligning their budget decisions with the kind of well-being framework. In Scotland, we actually have a well-being framework as well, um, which you can see on the right. So that's the big circular um, picture. And that is our national performance framework, for those of you who haven't come across it, which sets out 11 national outcomes for Scotland that kind of describe the kind of Scotland we create and that really uh, are meant to be driving all decision-making across the Scottish public sector and beyond, although we know it's not really doing that at the moment. Um, but it's not just in, in government, but it's also in or businesses and other organizations. It's really the idea that, you know, we have to embed that kind of purpose and social enterprises have been doing this for a very long time. So we've had an example here is kind of a local war, which is a, a local social enterprise based in Glasgow. Um, but there's so many amazing examples of that in Scotland. We only had to pick one to put on the slide, but um, you can all probably think of lots of them. The second piece then is prevention, and that's the idea that goes back to the long road that Karis talked about earlier in the concept of failure demand. So it's the idea that at the moment our economy generates a lot of harm and we spend a lot of money um, ameliorating, ameliorating that harm. Um, whereas for a well-being economy, we would try to design it so that it tackles the root causes of these problems and prevents this harm from occurring in the first place. Um, and in practice, for example, that means, um, Karis has mentioned some of the examples, but also it means, for example, um, mitigating climate change to so that we don't have to build flood defenses or clean up envir um, uh, environmental disasters in the future, or it means um, reducing air pollution so we don't have the impacts on health and the kind of burden on the health system that comes from that. And there have been now also a few interesting examples of how you can institutionalize that into, um, into governments and into other areas. So for example, on the right hand side is the Future Generations Commissioner in Wales, which has been around for about seven, eight years now, I think. And that's really, had, and that commissioner has a very explicit mandate to kind of scrutinize and advise the Welsh government to make sure that the, the interests of future generations are represented and that the government works in a way that is collaborative and long-term and preventative. And another really interesting example on the left is um, that um, investment framework in Victoria, state of Victoria in Australia, which interestingly was actually driven by the treasury because they were looking at the spending they were doing on like failure demands like prison services and other things and they were like well we're not going to be able to if that keeps going up we're not going to be able to to service that and so they were like well we really need to implement a more preventative approach and they've really gone and that means they have this funding basically where they spend money specifically on things that they think will make a difference further down the line and save the money and where and they've got and develop some methodologies on how to measure that and implement that. So, so it's a really interesting example. Um, the next P is pre-distribution, which is a little bit similar to prevention, but it's specifically about incomes. And this is the idea that our economy, the way it's set up at the moment, creates these massive levels of, of inequality in the income and in the wealth. And then we use this as some of the tax system to redistribute that, which is very important, but it would be even better if we could design it in a way um, that we prevent these inequalities from happening in the first place. Um, and there's, um, yeah, so there's various different ways how we can go about that in practice that um, essentially you would be looking at reducing the concentration in ownership of land on other assets and businesses to make sure that the, the kind of um, the, the revenue, the kind of profits from that are distributed more more equally that can mean for businesses for example increasing employee ownership and we've got um as an example there's um, Gerber Camper Vans it's a company in Scotland that's 100% employee owned but there's lots more examples of that um things like cooperatives um it can mean implementing things like community wealth building strategy as wider paths which we come back to in a minute but it also means things like public ownership in very important sectors that are focused on basic needs, whether that is housing, 
or energy, for example, um, can be a really important part of you know building that fairer distribution into the economy from the beginning. And then finally, um, people power is the last one, and that's really the idea that a well-being economy cannot be designed from the top down, but that it needs to be um, basically based on meaningful and democratic decision-making processes that um, involve everyone, but especially those voices who are not often heard when it comes to economic policy making. And that is not just because we're going to get it wrong otherwise, but also because there are quite a few um, tricky political questions to settle when you talk about a well-being economy, which I've already talked about. Um, for example, you know, what are the kind of things that everybody has a right to have? Um, what is a fair distribution of income and wealth? What are the kind of things you can make a profit with or cannot make a profit with? That are questions which um, cannot be settled by an economist like me, but they really need a kind of solid democratic process. And there's lots of kind of, again, lots of examples of how that has been starting to be implemented in practice. Um, like citizens' assemblies has become have become more and more common now to to, you know, look at bigger questions and important questions. Um, but they often suffer from a lack of um, teeth, so to speak. So governments don't necessarily implement the recommendations that citizens' assemblies provide, even if they're sensible. So that's why we put the 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 example at the bottom left, which is like the Burger Dialog in East Belgium, because they have very interesting come up with like a permanent citizens council in, this, in addition to citizens assemblies. So it's randomly selected citizens that sit on this council, but that council sits permanently, not just on a specific issue. And one of its key roles is basically to make sure that the normal parliament implements the things that the citizens assemblies um, recommend. But again, it's not just the government thing, but the same kind of applies um, we, to our businesses and other organizations that we need to make them more democratic. Um, and, and again, cooperatives have been leading the way in that and have a lot of experience in that for a very long time. And as an example, we've got the Green City Workers' Cooperatives, which are based in Glasgow and are, are one of our members. Um, so that hopefully gives you a little bit of a flavor of what a well-being economy is, some of the key concepts, but also some examples of how you could do that in practice. And before we come back to looking specifically at Scotland, um, what kind of things we are proposing for Scotland, um, we thought we'd do a little bit of a detour to actually talk about some of the other concepts that are in the similar space and are also kind of flying around in Scotland and can cause a bit of confusion sometimes about how they are related to each other. Um, and that can be things like circular economy, donut economics, um, community wealth building, things that, um, some of which I've already mentioned. And so the question is how they, how do they relate to a well-being economy? And for us, really the simple answer is they're all part of it. Like, as we said, the well-being economy is quite new and the idea, the kind of concept and the movement is to, to connect and amplify a lot of the stuff that is already out there. Um, including some of these approaches. And then Catherine Trebek, one of our founders, used to call the well-being economy a picnic blanket approach. So people can bring their own approaches and their own strategies to it. And obviously there is a certain shared vision and we need to make sure there are certain shared principles, but actually a lot of these approaches can share that vision that a well-being economy has and are basically different lenses, different ideas, different strategies of how we can work um, towards that. And I think that diversity is quite a bit, quite a big strength because there is no one size fits all approach to a well-being economy. Different approaches will resonate in different places and with different people. And there's a lot to learn from each other. But I think, and that's where we all come in, it's also very important that we make sure that it's linked up and consistent and that we can really build a collective voice to achieve these kind of structural changes that we're looking for. So I've picked out three of these, which have been kind of gaining traction and attention in, in Scotland. And I thought I'd give you a very, very brief introduction to them. So you know a little bit about what they are about when you come across them in addition to the well-being economy. And the first one of these is donut economics. Um, and that was developed by Kate Raworth, um, 
And this basically starts from this really powerful vision of alternative vision of our economy, which is the donut, which is on the slide, which is basically kind of two rings. So on the outer side, you have the ecological ceiling, which are essentially the planetary boundaries that Karis already talked about in the beginning, the kind of environmental thresholds we don't want to cross. And you have the social foundation in the middle, which is um, the kind of things that everybody should have and that society should be provide for good life. And it then says he puts the two together and says that the space in the middle is where we want to get to, which is basically meeting everybody's social foundation within the ecological ceiling. And that has kind of really resonated with a lot of people and has gained a lot of traction. And in the book that Kate has written about it, she's also introduced quite a few principles on how you design an economy that kind of can get us into the donut. And a lot of these principles are very similar to the four Ps that I, would learn, I, that I talked about earlier. And that has been basically been picked up um, in a lot of places. There's now an organization to promote it. It's called the Donut Economics Action Lab. And they've been running, developing a lot of toolkits and tools on how you can implement the donor economic strategy in a, or usually in a specific place. It's often been done in cities. Like for example, Amsterdam has done a lot of work on this. It's kind of one of the more well-known examples, but there also has been, for example, a donor economics city portrait workshop uh, project been done in Glasgow and been published fairly recently as well. Um, that's probably another link for the list, Karis. <laughs> um, afterwards um so that's kind of um yeah which basically takes this donut apart and really looks at how you can how you can how you can move towards it um the next approach is is degrowth which is a concept that has been coming out of kind of activist academic movement i think originally from france and um, but it's now spreading all all across the world and that really starts from the assumptions that especially in rich countries like in Scotland and, and Western Europe um, to in order to kind of get into the donut or to achieve become sustainable we have to reduce our resource consumption in a kind of equitable way to make sure that you know we can increase well-being but also kind of you know shrink our material footprint and our consumption so which I think is it's not a million miles away from how we define a well-being economy as well. Um, but it, the degrowth movement has been very good at looking at concepts like um, conviviality and like the commons and sufficiency and how you really also change the culture around the economy and how we live and, and work together. And um, and I think the the so in, in, in we all we can probably say um Quite openly, we made a very conscious decision not to use the word degrowth, even though actually in terms of the content, we it's probably very, very similar to a lot of what we've done in the well-being economy, because it's quite a powerful word in terms of really challenging and questioning the idea of growth as the be all and end all. Um, but it's also very controversial and makes it very hard to, you know, to build a movement behind it, which is why we're not using it as much. But there's a lot of overlap and kind of cross fertilization across the well-being economy and degrowth movements and ideas. And then finally, um, community wealth building is another um, approach that has come up and is getting quite a lot of traction in Scotland. And whereas kind of the donor economics, I think, and the degrowth comes starts from a bit more of an environmental perspective. The community wealth building it really has a history in the kind of um, economic democracy movement in the UK. Uh, sorry, in the US, not the UK. Um, so it's really an approach to try, it's a very, to develop a practical strategy that can be used to, you know, to develop a local economy in a way that keeps more of the wealth that is created in the economy, but also distributes it more fairly. And it's really looking at what are the things in the city or in a region that are all and the money that is already spent, what are the assets that are already there in terms of land that is owned and other things that are owned, kind of money that is spent by big organizations like councils or the NHS, and how you can use that to basically explicitly foster social enterprises, cooperatives, and other kind of um organizations and businesses that, that are then kind of you know better set up to you know, draw on local supply chains, create local jobs, and also kind of keep keep wealth locally. 
And so I guess hopefully what that shows a bit that a lot of these, I think, are very complementary. Like you could use the donor to develop a vision for very powerful vision of where you want to get to. Then you can use like community wealth building strategies on how to get there in, in practice if you want to find something that you can do on the ground. Um, and so it's kind of, as I said, it can be a bit confusing because all of these concepts are around um they're used in Scotland um more and more. Um it's not always clear how they relate together and we can probably do a bit more work there, but I'm hoping to get across that, you know, they're generally complementary and there's a lot of kind of overlap and really useful kind of diversity there. So right, so that gets us to the next bit where we um gonna look a little bit about what are the next steps in Scotland, what are the things where we can really shift the dial here. And then we'll hand back over to Karis for that. Great. Thank you, Lucas. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, we've put together a manifesto of policies we'd like to see, um, which has been supported by over 200 organisations in Scotland. Um, and that is very much focused on long term change. Um, but there's a few things uh, we can look at in terms of the action that Scotland can take. Um, for this. So on this slide, you can see some actions um, that Scotland can take to create a well-being economy. However, we will give the caveat that um, a well-being economy, as you've heard from already, hopefully today, is created in context and it is participatory by design. So this isn't a menu, but it does give some examples of what it could look like in Scotland. So as Lucas mentioned, we have the National Performance Framework, uh, which gives us goals beyond GDP. But we want this to be developed to a more participatory approach, including a citizens panel, so that the voices of people are heard. And we want to see the framework driving decision making further, um, and we'll come back to that later. Uh, the Scottish Government has some devolved tax powers, especially on the local level, which it can use to raise revenue, but also to achieve other goals that can help with economic system transformation. For example, a land value tax could help to reduce the concentration of land ownership, or it could help introduce a, a local carbon tax to achieve environmental goals. So we need to look at how we can start redesigning our economic architecture with the powers that we have in Scotland. If the Scottish Government is committed to land reform, and we have seen progress um, in that area, and I know there's more um, positive action ahead on that as well. But it could do a lot more to reduce the concentration of land ownership in Scotland and bring more land into community ownership um, and under democratic control. And Scottish Government also has control over most of the business support landscape in Scotland, and there's a lot more they can do to support cooperatives, social enterprises and employee owned businesses. And it could also mainstream training on business purpose across all its offering. Uh, the Scottish Government is currently developing a wellbeing and sustainable development bill. Um, this is a really exciting opportunity for us and it, because we, the, such a bill could create a step change for embedding the wellbeing economy and policy making throughout Scotland. We envision that the bill would have four key functions to so define wellbeing and sustainable development to create a shared narrative of progress strengthen the national outcomes and make them key drivers of policy decisions embed ways of working that are collaborative integrated and take a long-term perspective and create a future generation future generations commissioner to provide support and scrutiny and give unborn generations a voice. And you can see in the slide here a graphic of kind of the what and the how um, of what our vision for that, that we've created in partnership with a number of other organisations um, as well. But it's really important here that we make sure that the government delivers on that commitment and that the bill is as strong as it can be. So we often have a number of frequently asked questions um, that come up in these sessions. So before we move to our question and answer session, uh, we thought we would cover the three top questions that we get asked um, the most. So I'm going to hand back to Lucas for that. If you have questions that have come up while we've been talking, please do stick them in the chat um, and we'll get to those after Lucas has gone through these. Hey, thank you. Um... So I'm going to, as Kara said, going to go over some of the frequently asked questions. So the first one um, we often get asked is, um, so 
you know, it's all fine and good to replace GDP, but what should we measure instead? And I think we are now at a point where actually we've got loads of quite good alternatives. As we mentioned, in Scotland, we already have the um the national performance framework, which has loads of indicators on it, on the kind of different national outcomes. We've also got a new kind of a subset of that, which the government has published as part of a well-being economy monitor. Um which kind of is meant to track our progress towards the well-being economy. Um, and that's just in Scotland and around the world, there are loads and loads of other approaches of people who have developed alternative measuring approaches. Some of these are like just one indicator like GDP um, that kind of mash together a lot of different indicators to create one. And others use more of a dashboard approach where you have lots of different indicators next to each other. And they both have like different advantages and disadvantages. But I think the main point I want to raise, and I think the well-being economy monitor and the national outcomes and national indicators we have in Scotland is really a good example of that, is that the challenge is not so much finding other indicators or finding an alternative, but it's actually making it work. And there are two kind of really important aspects to that challenge. And the first one is that a big part of the power that GDP has is because it's relatively comparable internationally. So it's, it's an international standard that countries more or less implement very similarly. So the numbers are very comparable and countries compare each other along these standards. And we haven't got anything similar for well-being economy. And we probably never will because it's, you know, it's different things are important in different places, but I do think we need uh, maybe some kind of core framework that makes at least some parts of measuring progress more comparable across countries and that will then give it more more power and more um more traction hopefully and the second challenge is once we have alternative indicators to actually make sure they're used in policy making like we do measure a lot of things already and for example in scotland we have the um as i said we have the well-being economy monitor would be very interesting to see how many of you have heard about it um, even and it's definitely not being used in to drive policy decision making same for the national outcomes which is partially why that kind of well-being and sustainable development but that Karis has mentioned is so important because that would actually then say like look we've got these alternative measures but we also need to implement them and we need to make sure that they are the ones driving decisions so that's on on, on GDP the next question another very common question um, that causes a lot of discussion is the idea um oh i forgot one slide there are examples of other measures and reports out there which we'll put in the link afterwards if you want to find out more about how to go beyond gdp and measure other things but the next question then we often get asked is really how how would we fund the well-being economy surely there isn't any money there um and i think when people ask me that i start to get a little bit philosophical and they say well it's actually you know money is just ultimately a number in a computer so it's really about whether we have the wealth and the skills and the resources to provide for the things that we need and I would say generally we have those wealth and skills and resources but I think what people are actually usually asking is how would the government pay for a wealthy economy and not not necessarily society as a whole and that is a very legitimate question I think because um because I I imagine that moving to a well-being economy would mean that we have channeled more resources through a collective, through the government, through community organizations, rather than through kind of individual consumption and spending. Um, and, and, and there are different ways that the governments can go about doing that. And as I said, um, maybe starting actually from the bottom, which is something we come back to. So there are different things we probably want more government spending on in a well-being economy. Better that is, for example, a stronger social safety net or more investment into renewable energy or publicly owned energy companies or investment into retrofitting. Um, but there are also things that we're going to hopefully spending less on in a well-being economy because we reduce some of these failure demands that we've been talking about. So on balance, the bill, you know, the extra money needed might not be as big as it looks like at first sight. But even if there's some, there are ways we can go about it. And the kind of key ways which governments have used for a very long time and they're still using it. The first one is basically 
to create money, new money, which can, um, you know, which is a very good way to utilize under the UT- resources that are not being used at the moment, people who are unemployed um, or, or other resources. And that's not necessarily a wacky idea because that's essentially what the governments do every time they borrow money because borrowing is not actually a very good term to describe what the government does because it's not the same as when if we would go somewhere and borrow money because essentially the government creates new money when it borrows. And there's probably a whole lecture and a whole other web- webinar just on that in there, <laughs> but I believe it's. But then the other one, as I said, new money creation borrowing is... Um, it's an option. It's not necessarily, it's not without limits, government, because there are different things you have to think about, like the exchange rate and you know inflation. Um, but it's not as kind of problematic a way as is often described. But it's, as I said, it's very good to bring new and unused resources into play. But then we can also the other really important um, option governments have is to redistribute wealth. As I say, the wealth inequality is incredible at the moment, and that is really good for using res- shifting resources around to use them. So rather have them for luxury consumption by the most wealthy, use them to meet more basic needs by those who need them. Um, and there's various options for doing things like wealth taxation and stuff like that on the table already. So lots of kind of ways how we can how we can go about, but fundamentally it's about kind of how do we get the resources that we already have to the places where we need them, which is what we're necessarily doing at the moment. And it's probably worth saying explicitly that any kind of poverty that a government allows happening is a political choice. It's not a financial necessity. They could fund the social agenda, social safety net for everyone if they wanted to. The, the government in Westminster, that is not the Scottish government with the powers it's got at the moment. And then finally, I think it's a question around businesses, which is like, what, 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 what is the role of businesses in the well-being economy? And I think fundamentally, they're going to have to play a really important role in creating it. Um, there's no way around it. And a lot of businesses are already doing amazing stuff in Scotland and around the world, um, even if they're not necessarily cooperatives or social enterprises or um, specifically one of these forms. But there's also a lot of kind of structured things and um, that are really making it hard for businesses to do that. And so the kind of changes we need to see is really like to prioritize the long-term well-being of um, all stakeholders and of the planet rather than just maximizing short-term returns for shareholders. It probably means some more democratic ownership and governance arrangements. And it also means more transparency and accountability and impact measurements about so that we actually know in what ways businesses impact um, different stakeholders and, and the environment. But as I said, that's not necessarily, it's the same with the rest of the things we've talked about. It's not, there's a, it's not, every, not all businesses are created equal and there needs to be that kind of bigger architectural change in the business landscape to enable businesses who want to do that, to actually be able to do that. Like it's especially for a lot of small medium-sized businesses this can be really hard to do um and they haven't necessarily got the power to to make all these changes by themselves but there are already as i said a lot of really good examples there's a lot of really good tools out there like we work a lot with an organization called scotland can be who have got a really good tool and there are other options there as well um so it's definitely i think it's kind of a big big transformation but um lots of examples and inspiring stuff already out there so i will leave it there and um that's talking long enough and um yeah we would really like to hear from you now whether you have any more questions ideas feedback 